G'day and welcome again to another Campfire Project uh, panel discussion. And today, first of all, I have with me John uh, Hope. John's a life and uh, business strategist. How are you, John? Oh, I'm really good, thanks, Alan. It's great to have you here again. And we also then have uh, Thomas uh, Graham, who is an Aboriginal personality on Rima FM. G'day, Thomas. How are you? Good, mate. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. It's just going to be the three of us today, which is really great because I know the subject we're going to be talking about. Both of you have got a lot of input in there, so I'll be uh, really enjoying the conversation. What we're going to be talking about is how to become a high achieving and high performance male in a strangely anti-masculine uh, world. So, um, Thomas, would you like to kick us off on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, firstly, you want to pay respects to those uh, indigenous people watching, uh, past, present and future uh, elders, uh, thank you for, for joining. But um, yeah, I think it's quite crucial because I think from my point of view on this, this question is uh, there's two aspects. There's a, there's a personal aspect and, and what we have to do as a person, but also as a, as a community uh, member. And I think there's a lot of self-awareness in, in the approach to to, to achieving success in a strangely non-masculine uh, society. And so when we understand, and I shared recently in one of the other Campfire projects, uh, is that strength in identity carries us through. And when we understand who we are, uh, and when we understand where we've come from, whether we're, we're Aboriginal, whether we're Torres Strait Islander, uh, Indian, whatever, English, Pommy, whatever, um, we understand who we are, that carries us through the, 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 the well, I hate using these terms of trials and tribulations in life mm. um, because we, we stand on a foundation that is solid and a foundation that is strong in, in culture and, um, and life. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably, for me, looking at this question is, is probably the first step is to, to stand in front of the mirror and ask who I am, who am I? Uh, and from that, what am I going to achieve and, and how successful I'm going to be? So, mm. And uh, how do you um, relate to that too, John? What were your thoughts around that? Um, I, I totally agree, but it hasn't been my experience in that I personally didn't experience that. Um, I come, like, I'm Caucasian, so I, my background's Scottish. Um, I've got, I grew up and I had a, um, a highly functioning but very violent and abusive alcoholic mother and my father lives a long way away. So I pretty much learnt um, things myself. I, I was, I learned to be a personable person at a young age. So I had a lot of very close friends and family that probably filled the gaps in. So, but yeah, the, 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 it is true. You need that strength, and and, and um, but I think coming on the other side of it, I grew up with a like I, I had a strength within myself. But if you don't, but I had to get that, if that makes sense. Whereas, mm. but yeah, it, it, it it's so important to know who you are and your family around you. Um, mm. Not everyone has good family around them. You know, like that's just the world we live in. I, um, I've got I have got good family around them. It just wasn't my immediate family. So it was, um, but I wouldn't be where I am today or have done what I've done to this day if I didn't have that happen. It's made me who I am. So I'm not, I'm not against that. I to I totally agree with 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 what Thomas is saying. Um, it just hasn't been my experience. But are you there? Yeah, you got you now. Yeah, I, my phone's just playing up, so I'm trying to get that sorted. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so it, it is. It's so true. You do need to know who you are, where you've come from. And um, it doesn't always, if it doesn't serve you, then it rests on you to, to, to make up the difference. But there's, there's, always, there's always people around you that um, as long as you don't close yourself off. I think that's the main, main rule we've got to do is not close ourselves off from people. You know, you need, you need, you need people around you. You need, you need to belong. And that's where most of the mental health strengths come like people when, when when people fall down with mental health they usually close themselves off from everyone they're around mm -hmm. and um so yeah like thomas said it's very important to keep those people around you because they keep going 
absolutely. And, and I think too, like when we, especially coming from a, a 25 year old male um, and, and below, we're not very, yeah, we're the most connected generation uh, ever with our mobile phones and, and the platforms that we're using now. Uh, but person to person, we're not that, mm. we're, I think I heard on the radio today that we're a quarter of us are, are alone, but yet we're in Australia, we're in top three uh, countries in the world that are, that are connected. So like, what do we do then to, to make sure that we don't go down that, that, that slope of, of, of mental illness or, or letting life circumstances overpower us and, and become um, or like a, a bigger picture and a bigger strength that overpowers us. And I think um, for me personally, it was surrounding myself with people uh, that really cared about me and, and built me up. Like in 2011, uh, I lost my dad. And, and that was the hardest time of my life, but I still made conscious decisions to surround myself with people that I knew that would build me and to become a, a man that, that I am today. Now, absolutely, I miss dad, but there's things that I'm doing and I've, there's things that I've done. Like, personally, I wouldn't be on radio if dad would be here or dad was here. Um, like, I, I wouldn't be... Um, I wouldn't know more about my culture if, if my dad wasn't here because I strongly believe that he changed the record before he passed away. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many things that, that could bring us down or could have brought me down uh, into to a high drug abuser, alcohol abuser, um, to, to be a gambler and all these things. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't choose them paths. Uh, mm -hmm. because I put myself around the people um, that I knew were going to build me up. And, and 90% of them were in the church. Um, I know a lot of people don't have the best experience or, or a good experience with church, and I'm not promoting any religion here. I'm just saying my story in the aspect of I wouldn't be here today without the love of Jesus mm. and the people in the church. Mm. Well, it and, comes back to... And so that could be... Mm. Yeah, so it comes back to, as you said, you know, the church is just like another tribe. It's like the tribe we have with in Indigenous people. Even us, yeah, even ourselves, we have to have a tribe around us regardless of who we are, but it's the people we bring around. But we've got Absolutely. to have ones that support our identity and not ones that uh, don't, you know, are putting us down or, or don't support what we're doing. 100%. And, and, and John and Maxwell. Sorry. Yeah, John? Yeah, John Maxwell. Um, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, best leadership book that's ever been written. One of his 21 Irrefutable Laws is your laws of association. And you are the mean average of your five closest friends or people around you. Mm. So it's important to keep good people around you. That's something I've told both my boys, and I'm very proud to say that they both do that diligently. Mm. And where and there's been there's been times in, in, in where I could see that their association wasn't the best and it's pulled them back a bit. Mm. So... It, it, it's so important to have good association, which is what I was saying before. You, you might not ha have your people around you, and same what we said with the church. You go to the church, you get your people around you, and they, they, they're all teaching heart-based emotions. They're teaching prayer. They're teaching forgiveness. They're teaching mm -hmm. gratitude, faith, all those sort of things. When, you, when you, your mind is processing things in that way, you can't be depressed. You can't be anxious. You can't be unhappy. It's when fear comes in, and then you go back and there's some sort of fear that's there. And it's most of the time the fear's bullshit. But mm. the fear's there. Sorry, Alan. Hey, we're all by the campfire, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no other way to describe it. It's bullshit. You know, mm. and, and when you do that, the only thing that does, fixes it, is action. Which is, you know, Thomas was saying before, you take action. You take the right action. You mm. don't sit on your sit on your hands and, mm. and, and, and sit in the corner you know you, you go out take action keep mm. moving forward and especially losing your dad that's the reason to take action he'd want mm. you to take action he'd want you to be, do the things to to be proud of you not he, he wouldn't want to see see you wallowing in self-pity no one would so it and, and that's that's yeah you take the right action and if you get the wrong result you change the action it's simple mm. And if you can't find the right action, then you go and say, hey, dude, what do I do here? Mm. And you find someone that's actually doing it, they tell you how to do it. Yeah. You see, that brings that's us different. back to 
what you were saying, Thomas, before about you know being the you know the younger people being the most connected electronically, but not connected uh, with each other. <clears throat> so how do the younger people today, or what are they they doing? What are your understandings around it? In how do they uh, find the the right right way to move forward? How do they find the person who can give them that guidance if they don't have the guidance themselves? You know, where do they get their guidance from? Um, well, Mr. Google is is. <laughs> Not the best way. Hmm. I'll say it's, it's a helpful tool uh, and it's there for a purpose, but with so many opinions these days, you can easily get, get a mental uh, state a lot worse than what you already are. Um, but if you're at school, there's a, there's a lot of um, counsellors or, or just someone that you can relate to in your life that you trust, that you, that you respect, um, to go, hey, I'm, I'm struggling here um, and, and I need help. How can I, how can I get that help? Um, whether that's best friends the same age, um, whether that's, oh, like this, like for me, it was, it was uh, within the church, uh, like my, my lead pastor, uh, my youth pastor, there was, there was higher authorities uh, that I looked to. And, and most of the time, there was leaders within the church and also leaders within sporting uh, groups mm. that I was a part of that I wanted to be like. And so I went and, and spoke to them and asked them, um, can they help me? Mm. Uh, and again, my experience, I'm not portraying that it's the right way. Um, it's just a way. Uh, no, it is the right way. You're taking action. Most people mm. sit in their yeah. hands. That is the right way. Oh, yeah. to totally, totally. Mm. Like, it could be for some people going to see GP and, and getting medical help. It could be um, talking to, to your employee, your boss. Um, there's so many different people that you might think that won't help you, that will help you. The biggest, uh, the biggest tool for the, for the enemy or the, the, the power against you is the lie that you're alone in this. Mm. And you're 100% not. There are people that are watch, watching your life and watching what you're going through to go, okay, I'm just going to stand here. I'm going to watch him because it's only a matter of time before A, he's going to come and speak to me and need help or I'm going to need to help him. Mm. I'm going to need to step in before it gets too late. So I think in the time now with, with uh, being so connected, we are getting a lot of education in, in red flags or, or character traits or people that suffer from mental illness um, or someone that's, that just needs help. Um, let's, let's get rid of the labels here. Uh, if you can see someone suffering or, or someone that needs help, then you're one step ahead of anyone else because, okay, I'm going to go and help them or I'm going to be readily available if they come to me and say, hey, um, I'm struggling. Can you help me? So, yeah, well, it's one of the things that has been the theme that the one single single thread that's followed every conversation I've had with everybody on the campfire project so far. And there's been over 60 uh, people that I've spoken to, both men and women. Every one of them have told how their life had changed when they had that involvement with somebody else, when somebody else stepped up and gave them assistance, or they went and asked somebody what they should do. It's like uh, I think it was. Um, uh, Sean McBride had said that when he was in his greatest depression, he was always on his own. But when he was, every time he was with a tribe, that's when his life changed and his energies came back and everything else. And this is what it comes down to. You may feel that the world's against you, but it's really not. That's the feeling that you've got inside, but it's not the reality. There's mm. always somebody else out there, and especially those who have been through it. Because, you know, John, everybody else that we've spoken to, you, your own history, um, You've all come from a place where you've had things that happen in your life and then you turn around and you go, right, I've been through this and now I help other people. Mm. It's like you always look for a coach who has been, is actually <clears throat> where you are or has been where you are a few years ago and they've worked through it and they're the coach you go to. And every one yeah. of those coaches want to help because they don't want to see other people going through what they went through. Yeah, I, I was, when I went through the cancer and the eight surgeries and, I went blind and had the liposuction on the arm. The whole time, my whole focus was I'm not sitting in this frigging room. I got out. I spent time with friends. I spent time with family. 
I had to threaten my mother to stay away with an AVO because mm. she I couldn't handle her abuses mm. at the same time. But I I if I'd have stayed in inside, like you're saying, and, and mm. not have people around me, I I would have I would have um, you know, just wellowed in self pity and been a big mm. big bag of depression. And you get nothing. Like nothing mm. good comes from that. But you have a choice. You can mm. take action. Like Thomas said, you can take action. Mm. So wh- whatever you got to do, you, you know, resilience is, is twofold. There's, um, you got to get back up once you get knocked down. But once you get up, you got to keep punching. A lot mm. of people get up, but don't keep punching. And they mm. get knocked down again. And they just, you got to get up and fight back. You know, mm. at the end of the day, life's a fight. And the, the minute you give in, that's on you. Mm. You know, you, and 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 doesn't mean you got to fight and hurt other people. It just means you you've got to keep moving forward. It doesn't matter what happens to you. Life's all, adversity is always going to come at you. You've got to overcome it, move forward, take the right action, and that gets everything going. You get and you've got to keep on top of it. And the minute something happens, you can't. Most people stress is hmm. fear related. You know, they sit there and they're stressed. Well, take action. And the most people that are stressed, I guarantee you, because they're not taking action. And then, as Thomas touched on before with mental health, that's right. We're in a society where um, pharmaceutical companies dictate doctors and psychologists what happens to you. And mm. they're all about money. They're billion dollar corporations that are all about making a profit. You know, like aspirin. They knew aspirin was the best thing for uh, thinning the blood 70 years ago. They've been trying, to, improve, trying to, to, to change it up until about 20 years ago because they couldn't make money out of it because it was already mm. established, but they couldn't get anything better than it. So mm. now they use the aspirin. But they, so they don't want you well, mm. they don't want you dead, but in the mm. middle is where they make money. Yeah, so well, they get yeah. you in mental health, they label you, PTSD, whatever mm. it is. They then medicate and treat you, which is where the money is. Then they put you on a shelf. Mm. And it's up to you to take the action to get yourself off that frigging shelf. Yeah, well, if you look at the health industry, it's pretty much the sickness industry in the Western world. Any time you go to a doctor is when you're sick. Whereas I know in the uh, Eastern world, Chinese doctors, for instance, got paid for keeping you well, not for helping you get fit again, but for keeping you there in the first place. So it's uh, very much a thing. But it, again, it's we've got to look at the advice we're getting because some people are looking at the medication as the answer because everyone's saying you've got to be medicated. You need to look at the person who's giving you that advice and ask yourself or even ask them, what's your background? You know, if you're advising, if your coach came to me and advised me on how to change something that I'm doing in my life, my first question is going to be, is that what you use to change it in your life? And if they go, well, I never had that. Well, I go, wrong coach. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. If they say, yes, yeah, so this is what I did and this is how I overcome it. This is why I'm telling you this. I go, okay, that sounds good to me. So it's finding that right one. But as you said, there's the sitting on your own and not doing anything, which is bad. You know, you keep yourself in that state of fear. And then you've got the wrong person, which is just as bad, which is worse, I don't know, because uh, neither of them moving forward. But as you said, you've just got to keep finding those right people. And there's different ways of doing it. We only got to get up one more time you get knocked down. That's hmm. the good news. That's but it. the trick is to not get knocked down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it'd be great if that was a situation that none of us ever got knocked down. But um, well, life yeah, happens. There's, life, no, there's, no, there's no, there's no mm. getting away from it. Mm. Now, one of the things that I've really started to take more notice of, because I hadn't really been into competition sports myself. You know, I've done martial arts. I think but everything's been my challenge against myself, more so than in a team thing. But I never really understood for a long time the power of playing a sport like football. And how that can bring, that's like a tribe itself and the camaraderie and everything else that goes in on that. Because yeah. I know that, John, you've played a lot of uh, football at the same time. Uh, Thomas, you're also a, a, a coach referee. or a referee, I should say. So you're seeing uh, both sides of it as well, having played and also uh, coaching it as well or refereeing it. So with that, what are your your experiences around how it's changed some of the people that might have been there before with issues how has that changed their behaviors uh, while they've been involved with the teams you go first john <laughs> <laughs> well personally I, I, I like we said before it's about taking action and they're getting out and they're channeling negative energy 
and they're becoming part of a family unit because they're in a team. They're getting out there. They're they're getting rid of some aggression. But there there is a family unit in in, in football. Um, I know from my experience out with the Aboriginal um, part out of Burke, they consider you family. Like, Mm. you are so accepted. It's it's not funny. And forever. You know, you you get that with an Aboriginal community. You don't get that with a white community. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I go out, haven't seen him for 20 years, and I catch up with him like it was yesterday. Mm. Whereas other people, like, they don't, they don't have that. So it's, it's really good for channeling the negative energy, but I think it also teaches you boundaries. I think one of the things that we don't realise in life, like we, you, you, in football, you, you're taught a boundary. You've got a sideline, you've got a try line, you've got a halfway mm. line. You have to operate within those boundaries. And you have to do that in life. You need to operate within a certain boundaries because if you go outside boundaries where you don't feel comfortable, that's when you get a bit of fear. You get, you're uncomfortable. So you need to know your own boundaries. And football, football, any sport teaches you that. And once you have those boundaries set up in life, you can operate much better. But you've got to know, because otherwise you do something that's outside your boundary because you haven't said it but you feel mm. uncomfortable with it then mm. you feel shame then you feel guilt then you feel all those things so it's it's something that once you set those boundaries you then guard your mental health because you don't go down into those fear-based emotions because you know you've operated with the boundary. you feel okay about it you've got mm. you you feel grateful for being able to play football you know you've got forgiveness for the person who tackled you a little bit hard <laughs> you've got you, you've got faith that you're going to keep going on. You've got joy because you're having fun, you, but you, 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 you're um, having experiences with your mates. And but mm. one of the big things with football that I found was having a beer afterwards. It was great. It was such a big mm. comrade co- camaraderie sort of thing, you know, uh, relationship building. And it's just so good to be able to do that. That's that's family. That's mm. that's that's your support mm. network. And and it, it's like the mortar that holds the bricks together. Mm. Once they share those experiences okay. with you, they become basically family. Mm. And, and, and you can't wash that away easily. That's it. How about yourself, Thomas? Yeah, I think the thing that plays on my mind, and I shared it in my, my original Campfire Project video, is, is the opposite to addiction is not sobriety. It's connection. Mm. And, and the study sh- uh, that was... That was done on two separate rats. Uh, one rat was had a had a cage. Um, sorry, they both had a cage. They had, both had bowls of water in it. One was laced with with a drug, and the other was just laced with normal water. Someone the one was telling that me that this was laced, hmm. Yeah, keep it's, going. It's Someone incredible. Was me this, yeah, yeah, it is. Keep going. Uh, and, and, and the drug they told me was heroin, but you keep going. Well, the, yeah, there you go, heroin. I thought it was heroin, heroin, uh, and the rat was 100% dependent on that water because of the, the heroin that was the, the water. The, the one on his own. Hmm. Yeah, correct. The They're both on their own. Yeah. 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 The, uh, a, a scientist come through and did a, uh, looked at it and redid the study. One was alone still with the water. The other was uh, connected with so many different uh, like toys and, and, um, like a rat wheel and, and, and that, and the, the water was still laced with heroin, but it was very rare that it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was very rare that it would visit the water and it was very low dependent on the drug because there was purpose. There was something much greater to, to hang on to. Uh, and I think they also added further rats into that, into that, uh, cage. And, and so they were connected. And so I think, um, Two, uh, I loved what you talked about, John, about the, the boundaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'll touch on that. But connecting with someone else and coming together as a team and, and uniting uh, as, as a team for a greater purpose is so powerful. Uh, it, it allows us to, 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 to trust each other. Mm-hmm. It allows us to, to pick each other up when we do make the mistakes. It allows us to celebrate each other uh, when we when we do achieve great or achieve what we intend to achieve. Um, and and if there's a team that if there's a team player that's that's 
a bit weaker, mm. they can support them and lift them up. Mm. And yeah. so, so that that one is is so powerful in that regard. And to boundaries, not only do they implement boundaries in their in their life, but they've got to follow a set of laws. And and once they combine the boundaries with with practicing the, and and getting to know the laws correctly, one I don't get as abused as much on the field. Um, <laughs> But two, they they understand. Mm. Like they're like, okay, if I and, and they look at people like the, the Latron Mitchells or the Josh Otto Cars or the or the the um Cody Walkers and all them players that they look up to that are from the Mish originally, um, and like, okay, they've got to abide by a set of laws. I can be as good as them. Mm. How can I harness that? And yeah, okay, there's gonna be times where, where they they get to the week before the grand final and their team flunks out. But they're going to get driven to, to come back again. All right, boys, let's do it again next year. We've got one week away. Next week, next year, we're going we're gonna to get it and we're going to win, right? And so there, there's a greater level of respect there once we understand the laws of the game and how we can either, one, manipulate them to, to get them successful um, and to... to get one up on the referee because he doesn't know his laws. Um, or, or <laughs> so he, needs, he needs to put it on airplane mode so he doesn't get those phone calls that you were talking about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing I really loved, as you just mentioned, with uh, the, the experiments with the rats, where you had the two rats, one with the water laced with heroin and the one without, it first of all shows the effect of addictions by having something else that controls you that you give it your power but then also really like the one where you've got two rats that have both got water laced with heroin but one has got the toys and the then the introduction of other uh, rats into it and how it wasn't dependent on the the drugs as much as or any more like the other one still was so it really shows that yes we can get drawn off in the first case in, with the wrong things but then when we have the right people around us how we can change all of that mm -hmm. even still having the, the drug still there. The, the source of that addiction is still around, but having the right people around you, how that no longer has a, it's such a strong effect. Yeah, and, and as a referee, uh, excuse the horn, it's the ships coming in here in Newcastle. Um, <laughs> we, um, as a referee, we're at the forefront of, of any and everything that the 26 players have the baggage, right? 26 players come to the field, they all have baggage. Even us referees, well, sorry, I speak for myself, even me, I, I've got baggage, right? And how we connect and, and speak to that person and and respect that player will determine if we get the full brunt of their baggage uh, there and then on the field. Now, I've been pretty lucky uh, and I know how to somewhat um, read people on the screen. Um, whereas... And especially under fatigue, like mind you, I'm I'm highly fatigued. I'm not the skinniest guy on the field, uh, so it doesn't take much for me to get the fatigue. But when when I've got a coach sitting on the sideline watching the same game as I am, and they're addressing points at either half time or full time in relation to, to how I handled a player and what I should have done, uh, I can I can understand my process and their process because the coach's process is. Like, well, you should have authority, asserted your authority. You should have penalised. You should have done this. You should have uh, spoke to them and, and got it knuckled out. And I said, yeah, I understand that. Um, but when I... Prime example. Um, as an under-10s game, Central, um, this kid wasn't getting back the, the metres and he was, wasn't was in the ruck. So he wasn't impeding play, but he wasn't back with me at the defensive line. And I'm thinking, what the heck's going on here? I'm getting close to penalising, but I heard a player say his name. Now, the player um, reacted to his name and got back to 10 metres, right? By this time, I had a suspicion that he was on the spectrum. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm not going to penalise this guy because he's not impeding the play, but it can warrant a penalty for being offside, but I'm going to address him. And I think his name was Nick. I was just saying Nick. I said, Nick. Back here, champion. And so he'd come back and I'd give him a high five when he got back. And then I'd, I'd speak 
generally to, to the whole team as, as per my, my vocab. Um, and then I said, I'd say to him, Nick, you ready, you ready to go? You ready to go to tackle the ball? And he goes, yeah. And I go, all right, go. And so we'd go and the whole team would go and he'd tackle him. Like, all right, champion, come back here. Um, and he'd come back and, and I'd give him a high five. And so the whole game, then he's responding to his name. He's getting back to where he's, uh, where he is uh, meant to be. And, and, he's, and he's enjoying the game a lot more than what it would be if I had a penalised him. Hmm. 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 you got to set... you got to set... you got to set... Is something happening? Yeah, having a bit of trouble with the transmission there, cutting in and out. What were you saying, we, uh, Thomas? He's, got, he's doing that thing again. <laughs> Yeah. Doing that still life. Yeah. Your phone, turn um, it off. Can you... It's off. I'm not getting the call. Hello. Can you hear us there, uh, Thomas? You're there? Yep, got you there. Yep. I got you. I just got, you got me back? Yeah, got you oh, back. Sweet. So, like, yeah, I could, I, I could have penalised the, the young fella. Which had said, but that would have impacted his experience on the game. We have an incredible game, rugby league, and and my job is to provide uh, a service to to give them the the best possible experience. Now, what that did to to myself was, okay, I've I've read the facts, but also at the end of the game, I was standing outside the change rooms. So I finished all my games, and the mother came and the parents came up and spoke to me, and they said thank you. Uh, Internet. Yep. I don't know if you're... Are you on Telstra or Optus? <laughs> We're not getting you, bud. No. It's almost I, think, like, I think I know where he's coming from. Yeah. Yeah, you'll be having a bit of technical problems uh, there as well. Quite a similar... <laughs> I think it's a little bit like England. We need to put the another penny in the uh, meter. Uh, sorry, guys. Um, uh, uh, I'm not get, like this. Wow, it's gone. Uh, I hope it's the internet and he hasn't fallen back asleep. <laughs> <laughs> certainly looks like that, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, he's like... <laughs> You got this. Did you back? Yeah. He's got me? Yeah, got you there yeah. now. All right, sweet. I didn't fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, we're touching on what you were saying, I, we had a, my son, I helped out with the rugby league at um, Valentine. He was, um, I was just helping out training because I'm not a coach. <laughs> um, and he, he um, I ended up having to be coached this one time, and there was one kid on the team who was, he was an Aboriginal kid. He was only about twelve, but he was a ward of the state. He only saw his parents one day on a weekend for a couple of hours, supervised. Like um, he had a really tough life, and he played up for me big time. So I had him. I, I was hard on him. I got him doing push-ups, and he's swearing and carrying on, but I didn't get upset at that. I just made him do what I wanted to do. What I need to do, but I'm creating the boundaries. I said, mm. you do this, you'll get in trouble. You do this, you'll do push-ups. You do this, you'll run. You do this, I'll sit you down. You won't be part of the team. He got the shits, but afterwards, and my son was in the team, and he got. A, he said to me in the car, he's only 11 or 12, but he said, I'm very, that I, I know like that, but because you were pretty hard on him. So it wasn't hard, I was strict. I said, I didn't yell at him, I didn't abuse him. I set the rules. And I told him that there's no, and he's never had that in his life. Mm. By the next, I said to Jock, I said, listen, mate, this kid is going to love me. And I pushed him with the football. And I said, keep pumping your legs. I always gave him encouragement. I always um, did that. And afterwards, no one, because this is a tough little kid that's grown up in a real bad way. And he, anyone said something bad about Jock, my son, this kid wanted to kill him. 
And every time I went to a game, he walked up, he shook me hand, hello, shook me hand goodbye, said good day. And I said to Jock, I said, see, the only thing that kid's missing is boundaries. He doesn't mm. understand his boundaries. So once I put them in place, mm. the only person he feels secure around is me because mm. he knows how to operate around me. Mm. And and that's where we, we lack it. The boundaries aren't there. That's or it. rules. The rules, as, as, mm. as, as Thomas yeah. said. Well, the and boundaries... Yeah, we know if we have a child who grows up without any boundaries, like helicopter parenting, for instance, and that's all about the parents wanting to feel good about them. So it's got nothing to do with the child. The child ends up growing up with no idea of the social graces because we look at uh, the uh, boundaries that we put in place. Mum would always put the, the domestic boundaries in place, the ones that were close to keep us safe when we were young. Dad was the one who set up the, the world boundaries. And between mum and dad, we then got guided how to get to that world boundary the right way. So we went out into the real world. We went out with the social graces, the understanding of uh, what we needed to do in society with the right attitude. But if you haven't got that in between to that stage, it's like a ship without a rudder. It's sailing all over the place. And when it gets to that point, this is why so many kids are rebelling. There's no boundaries in place for them. And it's not the kids try and, um, and break us. The kids are actually seeing if we will hold. They'll test us. And, and they're you, confused. That's they're it. confused. They yeah. don't know where to operate between. Yeah, well, if you were given a um, were given a device without any instructions on how it works, all the levers and everything else, you get frustrated with it. But a simple, uh, concise uh, instructions on how the thing works and what to do and op how to operate it, we're okay with it. We feel great with it. And that's the same thing with kids. They need those boundaries put in place and the rules that go with it because then they can respect the people that do it. And it's a case of, you know, as you did, John, you just held fast all the way through. So the child mm. realised there was um, a, um, a structure that, because otherwise if you moved all over the place, there'd be no boundaries, there'd be confusion. And mm. again, they would just uh, go off in the wrong direction. They have no respect. Mm. So as I keep saying, respect, we might give someone respect. For them to keep that respect, they have to earn it daily. And that's what a parent's mm. got to do. Or a coach or anybody else who's dealing with anybody else. You, you put those boundaries in place, you stick by them, you're consistent. And that may come across to some as being hard, but I guarantee that the people who think they're the ones that don't understand boundaries. Mm. And the ones I wouldn't want to leave my kids with. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so it's... Yeah. Um, and, because everything with all these talks that we're having are bringing that together. It's talking about the boundaries, it's talking about the respect, it's talking about putting rules and everything else in place and being consistent and everything else. And every child that we know who's got that, because all the, oh, we look at Doug uh, Garth, as he said, he had a, um, a coach who uh, took him under his wing. And even though he fought him at first, the coach was consistent and it completely changed his life. Taught him boundaries, yeah. Hmm. And now and he's on now, the other side. And, and he's, he's trying to change people's lives, doing a great job. That's it. You know, using sport again. This is where I got a better mm. understanding because of the men like uh, Doug and uh, you guys that are doing that sort of thing. Um, as you said, John, it's about a family. It mm. doesn't have to be blood family. And in fact, you know, as they say, we can uh, choose our friends, but we can't choose our family. That's so right. when we choose our friends, the idea is to make sure we choose the right ones. We choose our association. Hmm. So make sure your association's right. If you That's hang around it. with, if you hang around with the blokes at the pub, you're one of the blokes at the pub. You hang around mm. with shitbag druggies, you're a shitbag druggie. Mm. That's it. Well, it's like, you know, and you mentioned about the five closest friends and everything else, and that's what um, Sean uh, Carson talked about. He had, well, he looked at his mates one day after he read uh, something like that that told him about the five closest friends, and he looked at his motorbike yeah, and he that, decided, yeah. got to change all of them. Got rid of the motorbike. Yeah and uh, changed his friends. And they yeah. said that changed his life. Yeah, yeah, everything's a decision away. You only got to make it. And we're, we, we are where we are in life because of our decisions. So mm. you just got to make the right decisions. It's okay to make mistakes. People are so scared of making mistakes and they get mm. stressed about making mistakes. You make, the more mistakes you make, the more successful you are. That's it. Uh, you just can't, you can't let them control you and pull you back. You've got to make mistakes. If you, there's no, no one that's been successful that hasn't made mistakes. I got an Australian title in fighting. I was the worst fighter, worst person to start with. Mm. My defense was the worst, but at the end of it, it was the best because mm. I turned my strength 
in my weakness into my strength. Mm. And it's all about practice. The more you practice, but I made mistake after mistake. My lips didn't form from my teeth coming through them, getting punched in the mouth. You learn pretty quick mm. when that's happening. Mm. <laughs> So this is the thing, you know, we talk about, you know, boy, you know when they knock, they would say boys will be boys and people are knocking that with the toxic masculinity and everything else. But boys are boys. And we have That's certain right. things that we need to go through to actually get that understanding and being uh, useful in our community. Yeah. And all of these things that are taking that away, this is where our problems are coming from. It's every person I talk to is upset and everything else. You ask them, well, what's your direction? Where, what do you know about? What do you put around you? None of them have a clue. But as soon as they start to see some structure, everything starts to change. Mm. And having the right people to guide them and that, as I say, always ask the people you're talking to. If someone's going to give you advice and everyone, as they say, you know, um, everyone's got an opinion, just like everybody's got a backside as well. Mm. And so it's a case of check that and opinion. They both stink. Yeah, exactly. In most cases they do. Because somebody <laughs> is projecting their stuff onto you. It's their life. When they're giving you advice, it's the advice that they're supposed to be giving to themselves that they're not taking. And so I always look and go, right, if somebody's advised me, first of all, did I ask you to give me advice? And then if I did, well, I'm only going to ask you advice if I've already found out, have you been where I am now and have you worked mm. through it? And that's the priority. And that's especially so to these uh, younger uh, kids that are coming through now, because we know that, they're disconnected from their families or their parents in a lot of cases. And we have to be attached. So they end up attaching to their mates. And so you've got adolescents, immature adolescents, uh, uh, teaching other immature adolescents. We wonder why they've got no direction. Mm. And we blame them for that. Well, we should be going, we're the older generation. Where was our guidance? Well, but, where was us? But not only There's that, a pretty... yeah, just real quick, and this is gonna throw a spanner in the works here. <laughs> Um, I saw, and obviously not everything on Facebook is true. Let me, let me emphasize that. Not everything on Facebook. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, horror. <laughs> but I saw um, uh, an article that stated that, that parents uh, could be fined for speaking badly or, or addressing their, par their, their kids in the sense of like pulling them into line, giving them obviously you can't smack now, which I was smacked a lot. Praise the Lord for that one. Um, so, are my, so are my kids, and I'm totally against that. Same with that bully legislation. It's bullshit. You're creating bullying by the bully legislation. Yeah. That they're, they're Political done. correctness is just yeah. creating more problems than ever we had before we started. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so society is telling parents how to parent their kids hmm. when, when really they're doing it. They're as you said, you, they're creating more problems, more mental, mental health problems because there's no boundaries. Boundaries are, are massive uh, and, and boundaries are separate to laws. Let's get that straight. Because mm. right? mm. the, the police officer enforces the law, the referee enforces the law, but the boundaries are what p uh, parents implement in people's mm. lives, uh, in, in their kids' lives. So um, for the better, uh, mm. the, the laws are, well, some would say, and, and John coming from police officer, um, that the laws are there not only to protect uh, you from from death, really, in a motor vehicle, for example, um, but now society has created this stigma that police are there uh, out to get you, mm -hmm. and and there's this fear that is portrayed with with police. Well, well, well unfortunately, unfortunately, it's true. We've yeah. got highway patrol that are revenue raisers. You know, they're not even allowed to come and help you. Mm -hmm on the street technically they still will common sense prevails but they are employed by the um by the uh, what do you call it, the motor registry whatever they call it now no, so they, they they buy their cars hmm. they pay their overtime they do everything and they're not allowed to help i had so many altercations with blokes that were in my station where i needed help with phones and people in custody and guns coming in and you just go no nah, it's not my job description good my station piss off Mm. because and you, you've just got to um like, unfortunately for my two boys they had a father that was a policeman mm. so tantrums did not work because all i ever did was lock up people adults that chuck tantrums so when they chucked the tantrum 
I, I, I had a rule. It's no, but when it was a tantrum, it's no next time. So they miss out on whatever they want next. Hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll give them whatever they wanted, but if they did that, I'd enforce the rule. You know, you got to do it once. Hmm. I don't know if you remember Happy Days, um, hmm. that show, Fonzie. Yeah, Fonzie. He said, you want to be a tough bloke? You only got to hit one person. <laughs> and so it's the same with that. You only have to you only have to enforce it once. Now my kids were like teenagers, and they'd see kids chucking a tantrum, and they'd look at me like the kid was crazy. Do they know what's going to happen? And it's like no, because the single parenting nowadays, helicopter, guilt ridden, they spoil them because they don't want the kids to go to the other parent, and it just teaches kids to be weak. Mm. Doesn't teach them to be strong because if you can chuck a tantrum. To get your way as soon as you come into the real world uh, you're a small fish in a big pond and you're not going to survive that's it you're just not yeah so their parents and you're are, not going to cope yeah so the parents are wrapping them up in cotton wool and everything else are really setting their kids up for a major fall when they get older it's like right, they yeah. turn up at school and you get a trophy for turning up well that's not going to happen in the real world and so no, then they get right. in the real world and they think the world's against them and they go what's going on here and it's as adults, as parents and everything else, we're the ones who have failed. It has, it's not the kids that are in that state right now. It's their parents and the, the community around them that are at fault because we haven't and taken that that's, role on. That's happening in football. I've been helping out teaching some tackling and stuff with some kids that are doing in the under 10s, under 11s. And they do a man of the match and they do a different person every week just mm. to be fair. And I'm like, mm. well, that's... That, doesn't help mm. but i can understand that you know occasionally you give it to someone who's you can see someone who's put in an effort mm. give it to them but don't just give it to someone because it's their turn you know yeah. it doesn't teach them any value it teaches them the opposite there is no value they get something and go oh i got that from turning up right away mm. they need to get that they need to assign value not fairness yeah when you i was know, a kid the the uh, you know the trophies were given out to the people who had achieved and everything else, but they had a trophy for the best and fairest. The best and fairest was somebody who had really applied themselves and they had the coach who would take them aside, do extra work with them. So they were getting an award for the work that they had put in, not for 100%. the fact that they had turned up. This right. being fair to them is not being fair to them at all. If no. you go, oh, I'll give it to this one this week, I'll give it to that one next week. That's not doing the kids any favor at all. It prevents no. them from actually achieving. It's teaching yeah. them to become failures. 100%. And the political correctness about smacking smacking and hitting are two different things. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah, you hitting, that's the abuse. That we need to, to stop. But if you've got a child who feels that there's no boundaries, you can talk to them and know there's no repercussions of anything like that, the end result is they're going to take advantage of that because they want to see if you can hold and you just fail. Yeah. Well, discipline, like you said, mm. smacking and hitting, you get a police dog, right? Mm they are struck hmm. and they are struck in a certain way. They're struck on the side of the mouth hmm. because it hurts the most. It's where the most nerve endings are. You can't do it on the nose because it affects their senses. Hmm. You can't hit them on the back or anything because it displaces their hips and stuff like that. But they have to do it. Hmm. It's part of their education. And the same thing with kids. And the problem is you get some dickhead parents who are probably off their face on drugs or, or alcohol or whatever that flog their kids or flog their missus. Hmm. Well, don't don't restrict the discipline of like mm. good people doing it the right way. Lock the piece of shit up that did that does the wrong behaviour. I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm pretty direct, Thomas. Mm. Sorry, but you just lock them up, lock them up. Mm. You know, but they don't. They let them all. Yeah, because that's just another yeah. form of uh, of child abuse in a, in a worse level. And that's the thing I get up to, that upset about this as well. And I can really carry on about it and. Uh, uh, you know, political correctness, helicopter parenting, all of these things. It's not about the kid at all. It's about somebody else. It's not about looking at, well, what was the actual um, uh, uh, discipline with the child? Was it an abusive one or was it one that guided him in the right direction? But when, as you said, Thomas, we're not allowed to actually raise our voice to our children in uh, public. Well, while you're not raising your voice to the child when they're playing up, everybody else is having a go at you and you're feeling worse about it. The child's been told that that's okay to do that and they grow up and that's the way they treat society. And then all of a sudden we've got, especially elderly people, complaining that they can't go anywhere safe because of the kids on the buses or the trains or wherever in the streets. Mm. No, so, yeah. 
you know, we have created this problem. So as we said, the most thing, major thing is we need to have the proper boundaries put in place. We need the proper guidance put in place. We need to find the right people to guide them through. And as a father, my job was to find the right men to have around so the boys would learn from them as well. Mm. And so, you know, I always, I didn't understand, I haven't heard about the, uh, find, you know, the, the five closest friends, that, you know, the average of them. But that's what I looked at. I thought if I'm the best for my boys, I had to have the right people around me. And yeah, I even started looking at that in the female relationships I had as well. Yeah. Mm. Because, you know, the kids aren't going to learn from what we say. They're going to learn from what we do. Yep. Action speak loud and words. That's it. So the coaching and everything else. So as we said, um, how to become a high achieving and uh, high performing male in a strangely anti-masculine world. Well, I think it's bring back some of those um, old th ways we used to do things, bring back old fashioned life. values. Yeah. And bring that's why we Bring back the what? Bring back the beer. <laughs> but this, this is a side note, and, and you just touched on it before about taking advantage of it. When I'm when I'm out to referee uh, uh, a group of under 14 kids, uh, boys especially, now the safe play code in rugby league, well, it bans you from doing a shoulder charge, right? But oh, no, what is a shoulder the charge? A shoulder charge is when you don't extend the arm and leave with the shoulder. <laughs> so, so I say to the boys, I say, boys, look, I'm here to referee get a fair game of footy. I want a strong game of footy, right? But the one thing is, if you want a shoulder charge, you've got to make an attempt to bring an arm around. I can't penalise you if there's an arm or an attempt to bring an arm around. First two times normally I, I penalise because there's no arm, right? They're testing they're testing them boundaries, right? Mm. But the third or fourth time after I've penalised, it's a good, strong contact because mm. arms come around. The whole crowd is screaming, shoulder charge, shoulder charge, and I, or strong tackle. Mm. And so they're, they're understanding, okay, he's, he's legitimate about you've got to bring an arm around. Um, otherwise, we've seen what happens. And, and, and a consecutive you've, amount of... You've set a boundary. Mm. That, that's and you've, taught, that's I mean. you've taught them mm. um, that you operate within this. I'm not going to. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to come down on you. That's that. That's setting them up so they don't fail. Mm. That's it. Exactly. Mm. Like they're, they're using the, the laws that they have effectively to better their game uh, and, and to make sure that that they're not uh, penal, getting penalised and disadvantaging their team because they're following the laws. They're, mm. they're, understand the boundaries okay he does he's he's happy with strong contacts right? but i've got to bring that arm around i just can't go like that i've got to i've got to bring it around mm. or make an attempt mm. so yeah and then bring back the biff oh <laughs> I was going to say it's probably time that we wrap this up. I don't know if that's the right point to finalise it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call sign of the night. We get a shot of us all doing this. If all else fails, <laughs> oh god! For everybody who's listening to it, yeah, you know, block that bit out, please. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what it's all about, anyway. It's, yeah, it's a campfire. We're sitting around. This is the sort of conversations we have. We joke about things, and we know that those sort of things are humour. This is part of the connection that people have when you're, you're joking. Whereas some people take that as being a serious thing. And I'm going, for God's sake, get over it. And, and, and nine times out of 10, Alan, and, and John, you said it before, like we're punching on, or, well, sorry, <laughs> I'm not punching on, I'm the referee, but they're punching on to get against each other. At the end of the game, they're down the pub having a beer together. Mm. Right? Yeah, that's right. Mm. They're fighting each other on the field because it's 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 a battle for cattle stations, right? It's it's it's, ma it's masculine energy, mm. and exactly. they're and they're channeling it in a prop in an appropriate way. They're not trying to kill each other. They're trying mm. to be competitive, mm. and the rules are set in place to try and keep it that way, so it's not a thug fest. Mm. And then you come together and have a beer afterwards and a laugh. Like mm. we 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 had one bloke at. Collar Enterprise. He was blind. He could not see at all. He was blind. He was a second rower. 
and he would run at you and he was a big guy and he ran at me and I tackled him and I held him up over the line. He was one inch away from my face going ballistic. I was shitting myself. He didn't even know I was there. But when someone, as you know, when they hit the line, when they can't anticipate that someone's going to tackle them, they hit hard. Mm. Yeah. And I've got this bloke and I'm holding him up and he's going, rah, rah, rah. And I'm going, Jesus Christ, hurry up and blow the whistle. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah, anyway, I don't know where that came from. But... <laughs> uh, like, after, after the game, they're down the pub and having a beer. Like and, yeah. and laughing about stuff and mm. and I think that is the culture of, of Australia mm. that we all come together, we we spend time um invested in a sport, we come together at the end down the pub having a few squeeze, you know. And nothing there's nothing wrong with that, right? Mm. Well, well we we had one our last and then one. and then we all go home good as good as butter. You know, mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, we had one at the Aboriginal pub at Burke. Now, this is a place where there's a little hole where you get your beers through the through the screen. Everything's bolted down. You don't go there if you're Caucasian. And me and another bloke were on the team, and we went, "Well, we're going to go there. We'll have two beers and get out of there before the shit happens." We were last to leave. We had the mm. best. It was the best night I had in Burke. Mm. Sitting around a campfire, playing guitars, singing songs blind drunk one bloke had a go at us they jumped on him and threw mm. him out mm. and it was the best night mm. so it's i don't know you, you don't always um you you've got to experience it you can't mm. you can't judge it because mm. if you're judging something you'll never you'll never experience it mm. but one, once you experience it it's it's mind-blowing mm. absolutely so i i i suggest uh that anyone on the Newcastle Central Coast Sydney region to come to Tugra on October 4th or 7th for the Koori Knockout to see... I'm going to be there, the sure. Oh, you've, you've gone out yeah, again. I'll be there. Uh, the power of community, but the power of culture. Ah, oh, I was doing a good promo too. <laughs> Mate, it was <laughs> awesome. But I, I think I got your thing. It, it is. It's all about family coming together and show the family in the sporting arena. It's awesome. Absolutely. It really is a sight to behold. And um, just don't be random when they lose. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, uh, when we post this, uh, send me the details and I'll put it in the comments. Um, yeah. So coming down to that and it's give everyone a chance in the local area and they have to go along to it. But uh, we've had a real, I've loved the conversation tonight. We've had some interesting times with the, uh, the technology, with the internet coming and going. Yeah, that's what I've had. God, it's always, it's quite yes. often. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, that's uh, in the gravel. Let's go right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Thomas. And John, thanks very much for being on tonight. And to everybody else who's been listening in, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation tonight and we'll see you on the next uh, Campfire Project uh, discussion. Bye for now. Thank see you. Much. See you, everyone.